Hello, everyone, and welcome to another full-length podcast. Just a few announcements before we start. Um, I'm going to be doing a video with uh, some other people on the Ukraine uh, crisis going on right now, the Ukrainian-Russian war. Um, that should be out maybe in a, a couple months, um, just so we can research it and really get get to know what's going on. Um, apart from that, there's we're moving the gaming podcast to thursdays uh instead of mondays all the next one will be released tomorrow hopefully uh just because we've been having technical issues um with those um yeah and uh finally yeah this episode is going to be a real banger uh it's going to be i'm I'm really excited uh we're going to learn about hylomorphism in philosophy uh we're going to look at book four Plato's republic which is the center of the whole book and we're going to look at you know, my, my own original argument um, concerning what we can take out of Aristotle's economics. Um, all right, so let's kick it off with the philosophy section. And as always, as usual, we'll start with a review of last week's material and then go on to discuss form and matter. All right, so in the last podcast, we examined Heraclitus's dynamic monism which argues that there is nothing permanent in reality, but only becoming or constant changing. In Aristotelian jargon, we saw that this idea is the equivalent of rejecting act, but not potency. To refute this argument, we saw that it is impossible for potency to modify something that doesn't exist already, since potency presupposes some sort of existence. Armed with these arguments, we were able to finally return to the first Thomistic thesis and examine it, um, which said, Potency and act so divide being that whatsoever exists is either pure act or a mixture of potency and act as to its primordial and intrinsic principles. Um, And I would recommend going back to that podcast if you don't know, if you didn't understand a single word of what I just said, I'd recommend going back to the last philosophy podcast to um, see how how I uh, laid it out there. All right, so having defined potency as the capacity for certain change, and act as that which exists and is modified by potency, we can see that whatever exists must be either pure act or a mixture of potency and act. Um, and again, I'm throwing all these technical terms around. Uh, we did, we, we examined these uh, in more depth in prior uh, philosophical episodes. So yeah, f- uh, feel free to browse through some of those if, if you're still a little confused on what, what those are. Um, all right, so I'm gonna repeat what I just said. Having defined potency as the capacity for certain change and act as the existence which makes possible that potency, um, which brings into existence that potency, we can see that whatever exists must be either pure act or a mixture of potency and act. Okay, why don't they say pure potency? You have act, you have act and potency, you have act and the combination of act and potency, but not potency. Now, why is that? What, why why isn't pure potency you know a real feature of the world? Well, with apologies to Heraclitus, pure pon- potency is not possible, as we saw earlier in the previous podcast, since potency requires something to inherit on. Uh, finally, primordial principles simply refer to the most basic causes of a thing, of which the most basic is a thing's existence. Uh, after all, without a thing's existence, there's no, no nothing no nothing that could modify it if it doesn't exist. Uh, while intrinsic principles refer to those causes that modify an existing thing, uh, a cause which is simply potency. Um, okay, so hopefully that cleared up, that reinforced the last episode. And now armed with knowledge concerning potency and act, we are now ready to start moving towards the deep end. Um, yeah, we are going to depart from Parmenides, Zeno, and Heraclitus, who were the three main, and well, not Aristotle, but those three who are the three main antagonists, as as I suppose, from our our first three philosophy podcasts. And we're going to move on to considering form and matter and the second Thomistic thesis. Um, Yeah, so the second thesis is, is, uh, beginning quote, act, because it is perfection, is not limited except by potency, which is capacity for perfection. Therefore, in the order in which the act is pure, it is unlimited and unique, but in that in which it is finite and manifold, it comes into a true composition with potency. 
Now, this sounds like, you know, a load of baloney, basically. <laughs> like, what, what does that even mean? Well, it sounds complicated, um, but we're just going to take, you know, we're going to take it bit by bit, and hopefully by zooming in on certain parts of this uh, thesis, we can we can gradually grasp the whole of it. Um, so for for this episode, um, it's going to be a bit of a shorter one, but we're going to be looking at potency. Uh, we're going to be looking at the last part of the second Thomistic thesis, um, uh, which is that um, act act or in that in which act is finite and manifold, it comes into a true composition with potency. So, so let me repeat that. In that in which act is finite and manifold, it comes into a true composition with potency. Um, so you have act and potency, and there's a composition of them. They're they're in the same thing. Uh, this is what you know. This is essentially the, the theory of, of hylomorphism that we're going to get into. Um, okay. So the first question to ask in relation to this last part of the second statistic thesis is how act and potency combine to determine objects in the world. What does it mean when you say act and potency are um, are composed? Or there is a what do you mean when you say a composition of act and potency? Um, well, enter Aristotle's idea of hylomorphism. Suppose you were to draw something on a dry erase board. Once the ink from that pen dries on the board, the ink is no longer in liquid form. If it were to be erased, it would then turn into smaller particles, but still with the same matter as it had before you drew anything on the board. Thus, this matter persists through changes, while the form it takes on varies depending on what acts upon the ink. Um, in extremely technical jargon, uh, yeah, you know what, actually, before I get into that, let me just back up and, and you know, review that last part again. So you have the ink in the pen, you write it on the dry erase board, and then th that ink dries. Um, it's no longer like ink per se, it's, it's dried ink. And then if you come along and take a, a, cl a cleaner or whatever, yeah, you, you, you know, wipe, wiping the dry erase board dry, then the dry ink becomes particles of, you know, what particles of, uh, dried ink. So liquid ink, dry ink, and particles are all are all separate things, separate objects, but the same matter is underlying all of those. So that is that is what so I'm gonna introduce this technical jar jargon, but that's what we mean when we say when we say a substratum of um, a substratum underlying potencies in question. Uh, you can't say ink because you know, ink only refers to the first one. So, you know, we have to, to define this thing, substratum, to capture the idea that it is really the same material, even though the objects are different, it is really the same material in the liquid ink and the dry ink and the, um, the particles that come after the dried ink is wiped off. Um, so we introduce this concept, of, this concept of substratum where, you know, the material is all the same, but the form is not. And we're going to get into form uh, as we go along here. So, in extremely technical jargon, the ink is the determinable substratum which underlies the potentialities in question, while the determinable patterns that the substratum takes on are what exist after the actualization of the potential potentialities in the substratum have taken place. So that was really complicated. The, the second thing to understand here is what do we mean by determinable patterns? So we looked at we looked at substratum, that is, uh, you know, the 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 underlying material going through every single stage. Um, but what about determinable substratum? What is, or sorry, determinable pattern? What does that mean? Um, well, it just means that um, once the poten potentials are actualized in the ink, so the ink has a potential to become a dry ink. So once the potent that potency is activated, actualized, and this ink turns into a uh, dry ink, then what exists is a different pattern, uh, so we could say, a different determinable pattern than what existed before. Um, the first one was ink, 
and now the, ter the determinable form has changed into has transformed into dry ink. Um, yeah, I don't know if I explained that well, but um, yeah, the um, so you have the substratum which goes underneath. That's that's the matter, and then you have the um, the determinable patterns up above, active actualizing the potentialities that the substratum has um, at each stage. Okay, and as Phaser puts it, much more, um, much more under much much better than I do. Matt, uh, this is his beginning quote. Matter is essentially that which needs actualizing and change. Form is essentially that which results from the actualization. So matter is the, the substratum, the thing that is waiting to be acted upon, but does not, it, it, the potency that is, that is waiting to come out to, to exist, but does not exist yet, or does not fully exist yet. Whereas the actualization is the form, the, uh, the form, the determinable pattern, the way in which that ink is, is built basically, it's that determinable pattern that um, is that actualizes these potentialities that the substratum has. Um, okay, hopefully uh, you guys are still awake at this point, but um, let's uh, okay, let's keep charging through here. Uh, okay, we also see this as a result of universals like triangularity. Triangularity as a concept is perfect while the triangles we see in reality are only triangular imperfectly. Thus, there must be some perfect form for triangles, i.e. triangularity, and something which approximates triangularity imperfectly. Finally, there must be something by which triangularity exists in this particular time and space. So triangularity is a general concept. Um, it doesn't, you can't like, you know, it, it you can't like write it in a specific time and place and, and say that that's what triangularity is because you're never going to um, be able to draw an actual triangle. And, you know, triangularity as, as a concept just doesn't exist or doesn't exist in um, reality. Like it doesn't, it's not a, it's not, um, it's, there's no material aspect to it. Um, so roughly speaking, being triangular can be said to be a way of being actual whereas being only imperfectly triangular is a way of being potential. Thus, a triangle which is drawn is actual to the extent that it approximates triangularity. So if you're drawing a, a triangle, that's more or less actual, depending on how well you draw it. If you draw it with like really wavy lines, that's going to be, you know, that the, the form enabling that is going to be uh, more, way less, way more imperfect. Whereas if you, you know, you, you have it on a computer or something, it's going to be, you know, almost exact. All right. So both this explanation and the division between act and potency now give us a better understanding of matter and form. So the division between matter and form is actually analogous to that between potential potency and act. Um, matter corresponds to potentiality. So that was the substratum that persists underneath as the ink is changes from dry ink, ink liquid ink to dry ink to particles, and then the um, and then form is related to actuality. So that is the determinable patterns acting upon the substratum to to bring their potencies into being uh, into a different form, such as um, dry ink from the or sorry liquid ink turning into dry ink. Um, as, as Phaser puts it, again, better than I could, uh, beginning quote, matter is passive and indeterminate, form active and determining. The same bit of matter can take on different forms, and the same form can be received in different bits of matter. Hence, matter and form are as distinct as potentiality and actuality. Still, just as potentiality is grounded in actuality, so too does matter always have some form or, or another. If matter lacked all form, it would be nothing but the pure potentiality for receiving form and fit and sorry, for receiving form and sorry, let me back up. I'm kind of stuttering here. If matter lacked all form, it would be nothing but the pure potentiality for receiving form. There would be no actuality to ground it and it wouldn't exist at all. So remember how we had when when we we're looking at the first homistic thesis in the in the recap, we had act, 
and potency, and then the combination of act and potency. Well, it's the same thing here again. Um, matter, so matter can um, matter can exist without some sort of form. So if you imagine form as act, and then uh, matter as uh, you know potency, then there is a there's the combination of the two. There is just form, but there's no just uh, matter um, because there wouldn't be anything for that to be here. And again, we went over this uh, ad nauseum when we looked at Heraclitus. Um, so yeah, all these ideas kind of build each build on each other, which is really cool. Um, so everything therefore is composed. Everything that is composed of form and matter is also composed of actuality and potency, but not everything composed of actuality and potency is also composed of form and matter, such as spiritual beings or God. So, uh, form, so form and matter are basically a special case of potentiality and actuality, um, applying to real sensible things. So if you're talking about something that only has a form, but no, uh, but no matter, then that would fall outside the sphere of it. That would uh fall outside the sphere of influence of um you know of form and matter whereas potential actuality and potency um cover all things that exist um all right in conclusion then we saw that matter is essentially that which needs to, with which needs change to come into being whereas form is that which results from the actualization of potentials latent in matter Besides this argument from the perspective of change, we also examined another argument uh, 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 including universals such as in triangularity uh, for the division of form and matter. To the extent that a thing approximates triangularity, it is said to be more or less perfect where triangularity is the form and whatever instantiates the triangularity is said to be the matter. Finally, the division between matter and form is a special case of the division between actualization and potential referring solely to the real observable world. All right, well, that about does it for the philosophy section. Bit of a shorter one this time. Uh, let's turn it over to politics. All right, I'm gonna take my uh, customary drink here. It's not easy to talk for an hour, you guys. <laughs> All right, so politics, all right. This one's going to be a doozy. Um, all right, today we will be reviewing book three of last week's podcast before moving on to examine book four. All right, so in last week's podcast, we examined how essential Socrates considers a proper training in both the musical and gymnastic arts are for the guardian class. Uh, we also read about his rather shocking ethic that people with sickness that can't be remedied should be allowed to die off, and furthermore, that uh, capital punishment should be used as, as a penalty for lawbreaking. Now, without commenting on whether capital punishment, I'm in favor of capital punishment or not. Um, that's We'll save that for later. So thus, these two directors for the medicinal and juristic practices are essentially two different means of uh, population control. And he says this like kind of explicitly, uh, beginning quote, then you will establish by law in the city a medical art of the sort we were talking about, together with this sort of juridical art art, judicial art, sorry. They'll care for the bodies and souls of your citizens, those with good natures, that is, but for those who lack them, they'll allow all those so lacking in body to die off, and they themselves will put to death those who are of an evil nature and soul and not curable. All right, and then finally, we considered his idea of the noble lie as a means of keeping people obedient. Um, uh, beginning quote, then could we come up with some contrivance from among the lies that come along in case of need, the ones we were talking about just now, some one noble lie to persuade at best, even the rulers themselves, but if not the rest of the city. So this noble lie includes things like that each person was made with either a mixture of gold, silver, or bronze and iron, and that whichever mixture they were born with, it corresponds to their, um, their job, so gold is associated with the guardians. Oh, excuse me. Silver with the auxiliaries, and bronze and iron with the money making part. Um, so this noble lie also includes strict instructions for the maintenance of each class, arguing that children born of different metals than their parents 
should be taken away from them. And finally, that if a bronze or iron were to come to rule, bronze or iron nature were to come to rule, the city would collapse. All right, well, that ends the, uh, the intro. So let's now turn to book four. Um, I worked really hard on this. So <laughs> this one is, this one is, there's a lot of content in this one. So um, we'll, we'll try to take our time th going through it. All right. The beginning of book four starts with Ade Mantus interrupting his brother Glaucon to argue that the guardian class described is not one that will make guardians happy, since it involves the sacrifice of many things which ordinary people would call desirable, such as wealth, comfortable housing, and other things like that. Socrates counters by arguing that what is being built is not happiness but for the individual, but happiness for the city as a whole. And it is for the protection of the city that the guardians you know, sacrifice all of these things. He then argues that, you know, both the extreme of riches and the extreme of poverty should be avoided among the guardian class, since riches make one lazy and poverty makes one stingy. As a result, it is necessary to look at the city as a whole for its justice and happiness rather than on any individual part, or at least to look on the city as a whole for justice before looking at uh, justice and happiness in the individual. As for how to preserve this happiness, Socrates argues that stability of music and gymnastics is necessary and that all the little things which aren't strictly laws, such as you know, children standing before their elders, would eventually be found out by them. So, you know, kind of like social customs, like bowing and, and curtsying and stuff like that. Um, having given it sufficiently enough thought to the city's origin and upkeep, Socrates is now ready to locate and define justice. Here we go. This is it. Um, he argues that there are four virtues which the city possesses. Wisdom, courage, moderateness, and justice. And that the best way of finding out what justice is, is to define and locate the other three virtues in the city so that whatever part is left over would belong to the virtue of justice. So this is essentially like an odd, uh, re re odd reductio ad absurdum argument where you're going to say, I mean, kind of in reverse, actually kind of the opposite of an odd reductio ad absurdum argument because you're going to take you're going to figure out what the three virtues before justice are for and then whatever is left is is going to be justice so kind of like uh kind of like a bit of a um you know game of hide and seek or whatever uh justice is will be the last one standing um okay so yeah and if you're wondering where these four virtues come from uh sorry um <laughs> i should know this wisdom courage uh moderate moder moderateness and justice well plato doesn't really give us any reason to take those as um you know the four virtues that a city must have at, at face value um certainly justice would make sense but it's a little it's a little weird that there isn't um that he just takes this on intuition and doesn't go into why these four virtues specifically out of you know all the possible virtues out there. Um, okay, so to establish this argument, remember he's just we've we, we've just introduced the four virtues of uh, wisdom, courage, moderateness, and justice. And Socrates is going to go down the line and examine each one before turning to justice. So in the first place, Socrates examines wisdom and determines that it is that by which the city is well counseled by its ruling part. Next, Socrates defines courage as knowing what to fear and what not to fear, and as a preservation or power in the face of all manner of ills. Finally, he defines moderateness as a mutual concord between classes over who should rule. After considering these three virtues, Socrates argues that the thing left over is the doing of what is properly one's own, which must correspond to justice. So this is the answer. This is the answer to the, the entire book's question. Um, the thing left over from this examination is the doing of what is properly one's own. Justice is the doing of what is properly one's own. Um, so in the city, this means that each class does what is properly its own, the gold to rule with wisdom, the silver to act courageously, and the bronze slash iron to act moderately without meddling from other classes. Justice, therefore, applies to every class rather than to any one class as the other three virtues do. All right, so having found out what justice is in the state, 
Socrates now turns to examine justice in the individual, which as we saw in book two, was considered by Socrates to be in line with justice in the state. If you will remember uh, Plato's ex or Socrates' example of a large rock with letters and a small rock with letters, and you can't see the small rock, but you can see the big rock, then you know his argument was, well, you should look at the letters on the big rock, so th and those will help you understand the letters on the small rock that you can't read. So, um, yeah, so now, now we have the city laid out. We have justice in the city laid out. We already examined into how the origins of a city lead to the city and how the city is just. So the last thing to do is to examine how the individual is just. Um, and Socrates argues that, um, again, these three virtues apply to the individual. And as these three virtues of, or four virtues, sorry, uh, wisdom, courage, moderateness, and justice that ru rule over the soul just as they rule over in the city. So this, for, for Plato, they're essentially a, um, essentially a mirror of each other. Like they, they, uh, the city is, is bigger, obviously, but the same principles apply to both, uh, in both cases. So this is also, this is, this is Plato's famous theory of the tripartite soul. And that just means the soul split into three parts. Um, so yeah. So taking, to begin with, um, to begin with this argument, Socrates argues that it is impossible for opposite inclinations to exist at the same time. Um, taking the example of thirst, he argues that everyone at some point or another has restrained himself from quenching it, like I am right now, actually. Uh, furthermore, thirst is always a desire for drink and never manifests as anything else. Therefore, since opposite inclinations can't exist at the same time in one part of the soul, and since thirst never manifests as anything else in the part of the soul it's in, there must be another part of the soul corresponding to the part of the soul that prevented the quenching of thirst. So basically what he's saying is, is um, uh, uh, yeah, so basically what he's saying is, is thirst always exists as a desire for the same thing. Like if you get the, if you get the feeling of thirst, you're not going to, you're not going to want to eat, you know, food. So to satisfy the thirst, you're going to want to drink something. Um, and so, so that, that desire pops up or another desire like hunger. And we recognize what that means and what we have to do to remedy it because they always all, they only come up for, you know, the one thing that they're, that they're trying to get your body to, to do in thirst case, like water and, uh, hunger's case food. So on the basis, so if you're, if you're holding back on satisfying your thirst as I am right now, or hunger, then it can't be the same part of the soul that is having the thirst and the hunger holding itself, you know, be, being at war with itself. There must be another part which um, says, you know, yay or nay to that desire, or, you know, the, that other part, it, and that part is capable of pulling the, that, the des desiring part of the soul away from thirst or hunger. So on the basis of this argument, Socrates goes on to put all animal desires which manifest only as themselves into what he terms the animal part of the soul and the desire which regulates these animal impulses as the reasoning part. So does this mean there are only two parts of the soul? No. Socrates locates a third part of the soul, the spirited part, which he argues is present in all animals and small children and which includes emotional desires, but is irrational in and of itself. So therefore, Socrates argues that on the basis of this, that there must be three parts of the soul as there were in the city, since the individual must correspond to the city. So he's using two arguments here. He's, he's using one from observation of animals and children and one from the, the, the uh, sameness of the individual to the city. Um, so two arguments going there. Um, Finally, Socrates considers justice in the individual, uh, which he argues is the doing of each part what is properly its own without meddling from any other part, a virtue which once again, he argues, encompasses all three parts of the soul. So remember, the, the, in the city and in the soul, like the, the, the rational part is associated with wisdom, the spirited part is associated with courage, the uh, animal part is associated with moderateness, but justice is associated with all of them, 
because it governs how it it governs how they behave in relation to each other. Um, so yeah, and actually, incidentally, this is why Socrates spoke so much about musical and gymnastic training in the last book, um, because these two disciplines train the rational and spirited part of the soul how to govern over the appetitive or animal part of the soul. Um, so they there was some relevance there for what for what he was talking about. So how does the soul move then? This is the next question. Does each part move individually from the other, or do all act when something is done? Well, since justice permeates all the other virtues, as we just said, it, it, it governs all of them and binds them together into one action, it would seem logical that it, that it is the entire soul acting at once in every action. Otherwise, if each part moved individually independent of the others, the entire person would be unable to act with more than one part of the soul at a time. Beginning quote. And the truth is, justice was something like that as it seems, but not anything connected with doing what it properly belongs to oneself externally, but with what's on the inside that truly concerns oneself and properly belongs to oneself, not allowing each thing in him to do what's alien to it or the classes of things in his soul to meddle with one another, but setting his own house in order in his very being. He himself ruling over and bringing order to himself and becoming his own friend and harmonizing three things, exactly like the three notes marking a musical scale at the low end, the high end, and the middle. Oh, man, that's, that's a genius example. Uh, and if any other things happen to be between them, he binds all of them together and becomes entirely one out of many, moderate and harmonized. Only when he's in this condition does he act. If he performs any action having to do with acquiring money or taking care of the body, as well as anything of a civic kind or having to having to do with private transactions, in all these cases he regards an action that preserve, preserves that condition and helps to complete it as a just and beautiful act and gives it that name, and regards as wisdom the knowledge that directs the, that action. Anything that always breaks down that condition he regards as an unjust action, and the opinion that directs that he regards as ignorance." End quote. It's a long quote, but this is, you know, this is the meat of the book right here. Um, yeah, wow, yeah, and, and also it's just a spectacular, the, the harmonization of music is just a spectacular analogy for, for what he's trying to get across. Um, all right, so in conclusion then, Socrates begins book four by arguing that it is the happiness of the city that is being aimed at rather than that of any particular individual. He argues that musical and gymnastic training are essential for the upbringing of people and later in the book, argues that it is through this training that men are better able to rule themselves. This concludes Socrates' inspection into the origins of the city, and he now turns to tackle the concept of justice in the city and the individual, the topic upon which the whole entire book is centered on. Socrates argues that there are four virtues in the city, wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice, and that justice is whatever is left over after having considered the other three. Wisdom refers to good counsel, courage to knowledge of what ought or ought not to be feared, and moderation to an accord between classes as to who should rule. Um, Socrates argues that justice then must be the doing of what is properly one's own in each of the classes without interference from another class. Extending this to the individual, Socrates argues that there are three parts to the soul, a reasoning part, a spirited part, and a desiring part or an animal part. Each of these three parts corresponds to the three parts of the city and justice in the individual as in the state is the doing of each part of the soul what is properly its own without interference from another. Justice in the individual permeates all three parts of the soul and is, and is that which binds them into a single action rather than each part having to act on their own. All right, so that was a bit of a, bit of a doozy there. Um, next week we'll be taking a look at book five and yeah i'm really sorry i know i mentioned in last pod the last podcast that i wanted to do two books of players republic at a time but this is it was you know seeing book four and how you know how how detailed it was i you know I, there isn't enough time for me to put in there wasn't enough time for me to put book five in so we'll look at book five maybe we'll just do book five next time or maybe we will do book five and book six part of book six or something like that but we'll we'll figure it out as we go along um all right i think that does it for the politics section 
And yeah, I'm going to now satisfy my quench for thirst. Wait, yeah, I'm now going to quench my thirst. Yeah, people who only look at the economics section, this is what you're missing. All right, well, that takes us to um, economics, the economic section. Um, sweet, this is going to be uh, pretty epic, hopefully. Uh, but I do like this. I do like this argument um, that I that I come up with. Let me just try to find it here on the notes. All right, so welcome to the economics portion of the podcast. We're going to be reviewing Aristotle's uh, economics which we examined last podcast, and we're going to see how it might be a starting point for working Catholic economic theory. In the last podcast, we examined Aristotle's economics and noted the main points. The crux of the book is the relationship between the master and his mistress, a relationship Aristotle argues is naturally higher than that between animals, since animals only act to further existence, whereas people act, the man and the wife act, to further a happy existence. Both master and mistress have different duties, but they all tend towards the same end. Beginning with the mistress then, Aristotle argues that she must avoid gossip, manage money, avoid costly raiment, and she should be one who has an inclination towards a well-ordered life. She ought to obey her husband, treating his requests as if they came from God, and pray for him that he shouldn't meet adversity. This is All this is Aristotle speaking, not a direct quote, my paraphrase, but um, yeah, this is, this is Aristotle, not... I should have clarified at the beginning. This is Aristotle, not Plato or Socrates. Um, he also is, so the husband, for his part, must pay the proper attentions to his wife and should make her the unstinting object of his concern. He also has a duty not to be promiscuous since he is his mistress's property. Finally, he should treat his mistress with moderation mingled with a holy fear. The treatment of the rest of the household and of societies bigger than the household are also essential parts of Aristotle's economics. In terms of the rest of the household, Aristotle argues that there are two things to consider, materials and people. Materials include all things necessary for the proper management of the household, such as crops, garments, you know, etc., etc., etc. People include the master and his mistress, plus any slaves or servants. Aristotle argues that the master must have four qualities, the ability to acquire things, the ability to keep what he has acquired, the ability to improve his property, sorry, the ability to improve his property, and finally, the ability to make use of what he has. The mistress of the household ought to keep an eye on the property as well as do more sedentary things like handicrafts and the like. In the raising of children, the master ought to see to their education, while the mistress ought to see to their nurture. Finally, slaves ought to be treated fairly, and it behooves the master or mistress of the household to set a good example for them. All right, so having considered the management of the household, we now turn to management of larger societies. Aristotle argues that the management of the household is prior to the management of the state. Since the household can exist without the state, but the state can exist without the household. This is still a review of, of last podcast, by the way. Um, these higher forms of government include the king, the governors, the free state, and the individual. The three traits necessary for the proper administration of all of these are familiarity with ta the task at hand, good natural endowments, and an upright and industrious way of life. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about this summary is that there are no equations whatsoever. Um, if you pull out a standard microeconomics textbook, textbook, which I unfortunately forgot to grab for you guys, but if you pull one out, you know, that's what you get. Lots of equations, lots of, you know, numbers and calculus and other gory stuff. Now, these things are all right on their own. They help us to better study uh, an aspect of a thing as part of the whole, but these equations can't be completely devoid of context. So remember what I said, well, okay, if you saw the philosophy, the first philosophy video um, in the first full-length podcast, you remember that I did an example with ta Taco Bell, where as a food critic, you need to judge a taco. Um, there are two ways of doing that. You either eat the whole taco or you isolate an ingredient and just look at that. What, I, what what equations do is they take out an ingredient and just look at that. Um, they are not a replacement for the whole taco. And that's kind of what my argument is here. Um, 
So they, these equations need context around them to properly understand, you know, why they're, they need, they need some sort of backing or some sort of context to, to be meaningful in any way. Um, so, yeah. And then again, this also mirrors my argument in, I think, two podcasts, two podcasts ago, um, and no, 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 it was the first economics podcast, Contra Positive and Negative Economics. Um, there, this is this argument that um, you need context, you need a moral value in forming your uh, economic um, considerations because economics by its nature as a mathematical, as a, like can only look at quantifiable things and so cannot comment on ethics you need an ethical basis for which to, to base economics off of. And that was my argument in the, I think, first economics podcast of this uh, series. So, um, yeah, so kind of touching along two arguments there. Um, so, in Aristotle's economics, he, uh, he supplies the context, but doesn't attempt to analyze anything statistically. So no equations, no statistics, just pure con context. This is quite simply because context can be discussed without equations, but equations can't be discussed without context. In modern day economics, formulae are given to, given to you to relate two different objects together, but remain the same whichever object is being studied, which is fine if your theory provides you the context with which to understand your equations. Unfortunately, it doesn't. In my economics courses, they didn't teach me anything about the economics of Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas or even Adam Smith or Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, or Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, both his um, both students under him, or Maynard Keynes, who is a very more liberal uh, thinker, or Joseph Schumpeter or Milton Friedman, they didn't show any of that. It was just a wall of you know equations and, frankly, I would say obsolete ideas of obsolete hyper rationalized ideas of what a human person is and what his aims are um instead so yeah instead of all instead of a proper economic theory so with context i mean heck even marx can do that um instead what i got was game theory indifference curves gdp and consumer price index which all presuppose the rational behavior this hyper rational behavior um uh towards self-interested co consumerism so modern economics is engaged in a completely futile endeavor at this point to purge itself of any context whatsoever in trying to pass off its presuppositions of human behavior as axiomatic principles rather than as statements of you know opinion or you know hey we need to leave we got we got to leave this up to philosophy and then let them figure it out. So how do we fix this apparent gulf between context and statistics? Well, let's return to Aristotle. Rather than abstracting from everything else except a person's desire for material goods and assuming that they always act in their own self-interest, Aristotle starts with the family and its preservation as the essential task of the household. This theory briefly touches on things within modern economics, such as the necessi necessity for the master of the house to acquire, keep, improve, and make use of what he has, but this is only, uh, this is only alongside a bunch of other uh, duties that the various members of the household has and that the husband has. So beyond this, uh, so so beyond this, economics, the book economics, it introduces topics in the realm of ethics, politics, and a correct understanding of human behavior and gives useful pointers in each. Um, in ethics, it provides the directives for the correct behaviors of the master and the mistress to each other and to their household. In politics, it postulates the different forms of government and their proper administration. Finally, in terms of the household, or in terms of the understanding of human behavior, it is not self-interest, but rather the love, rather love that binds the master, the mistress, their children, and, and everyone else in the household to each other. Thus, this is the first thing that, that must be understood. Context matters, and if your context is wrong, so will your formulae be. Garbage in, garbage out. So this notion of the family leads to a second thing we should notice, which is that the lowest unit in society is not the individual, but the family. 
The relationship between master and mistress takes center stage on Aristotle's system. Uh, in book three, that was like all he, he talked about. Whereas under the zeitgeist of liberalism in America, it is the individual detached from other ties which takes, takes center stage. Um, sorry for the fancy words. I kind of I write like this when I get like really riled up. So um, you'll just have to live with it, I guess. Just keep a dictionary on hand. <laughs> um, it is possible to distinguish between a person and his family or community conceptually as long as it is understood that this isn't what the entire person is. Um, so, yeah, like you can, again, you can, you, you can, economics does have the ability, the, the uh, mandate to, to pull out people from the relationships around them and just analyze, you know, their individual wants and desires and stuff like that. Um, but again, it, it cannot pass those, that study of the individual as, you know, applicable to the whole society. Like you, you have to, you, it, it's the individual separate from the society is different from the individual in the society, the actual whole. You gotta, you gotta explain the whole thing rather than explaining part of it. And then it's, and then saying that it's the whole thing because, you know, uh, economics can't quantify, uh, economics uh, isn't able to quantify the other stuff, so they must not, you know, be important or whatever. Um, so people, oops, sorry, people act in relation to the fabric of society, whether small or large, and are not the autonomous atoms that liberalism takes them to be. And by liberalism, I mean old school liberalism of the, uh, ref, uh, not the Reformation, wow, of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, um, that a lot of the thinkers there that developed classical liberalism, um, this is seen by the fact that individuals are bound by all of the four governors men mentioned by Aristotle to the king, to the governor, to the free state, and towards one's kin. Even in a quote-unquote state of nature, people are irreducibly split into male and female and are thus by their natures related to each other and that, on that basis, even without any, you know, any organization whatsoever. Like, you're still either male or female. Um, and that will lead to different that you males and females are just different from each other. So there's, you know, trying to atomize both and claim that, you know, every person, regardless of, of sex or gender or whatever, um, ought to, ought to pursue their own path. Well, you're glossing over the fact that men and women are, were built for, for complementary but different ends, which, uh, no, sorry. Uh, different means, but the same end, as Aristotle said um, in the uh, in our first in the first um, takeaway that that we had. Um, so, yeah, so children are related too, like not just male and female, but children. They're related and dependent upon their parents, and people lean on each other for the things they all need. Like I'm dependent on the grocery, like the supermarkets, getting getting my family food. I'm dependent on my family for my room. I'm dependent on, I'm dependent on everybody. Like there's no, there's no, uh, I'm not a, I'm not an autonomous unit. Like I can't, I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to be able to survive with, with, if everything is taken away from me, you have to consider people in relation to the, to other people as a part of society. Oh, excuse me. Um, so yeah, it's just, isn't true that a man can be an island unto himself. Thus, this is the second thing we can glean from Aristotle's work. It is not the self-interest of the individual, abstracted from all its relationships, which ought to underlie economic study of human behavior, but rather the interests of the family, considered both in relationship to each other and to the household. Thirdly, Aristotle proposes certain virtues which he argues are necessary for proper administration. These are familiarity with the task at hand, good natural endowments, and an upright and industrious way of life, as we saw in the recapitulation of last podcast. Note how these are all capacities or powers of the individual. Virtues, they're all virtues. This is significant because present day economics, as we saw before, presupposes the very thing it is studying and is thus unable to modify or pass judgment on the things or qualities of the, qualities of the things being studied. It doesn't study ethics. It doesn't study, um, you know, it, it can't quantify virtue. Like, like you can't quantify how, how virtuous someone is. 
um, A, because you don't know, and I mean, only God can do that. Um, and I don't think we have access to his spreadsheet. So, um, I mean, unless someone can tell me otherwise. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 you know, this whole idea that you just, that whatever is not quantifiable must not be important is just, it's, it's just begging the question for, um, for, for modern day economics and not an actual argument in favor of it. So thus in a conjuring act, modern economics simply assumes that there aren't things like virtues or capacity since it can't quantify them. As I just said, this is about as silly as saying that there aren't stars because we can't sense them directly. But wait, you might say, isn't Aristotle stepping on ethics toes here as well? The answer is yes, actually, but only as we argued before that it is impossible for economics to completely divorce itself from ethics. Please see the first, first video for this if you if you haven't. Um, so yeah, eth um, economics or the Aristotle's economics does tread on ethics toes, but that is because ethic that's because the normal the the norms backing the moral norms backing up uh, um, economics are properly a part of ethics and not to you know economics today as we conceive of it. Um, and so in that sense, a proper economics should be a subset of ethics. A subset of ethics, um, I would argue, studying the virtue of prudence, basically, um, rather than a, a uh, you know, uh, just a, a, a farce of like, you know, um, farce of like, you know, this, this farce of like, you know, people are, are, are only acting their rational consumerist self-interest like that's that's just not it's obsolete that's outdated um and even if it wasn't it's still wrong um so this leads us to the third takeaway from aristotle's economics which is that it is a part of ethics which i was which is just what i was saying which deals with the management of the household and administration of government so yeah it 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 gets, there are, you know, it is useful. I'm not saying throw everything, throw the baby up with the bathwater. What I am saying is, you know, there, there, there is a lot of bathwater <laughs> and I'm not sure that the baby is still, still alive down there. Um, so returning to our original question then, how do we fix the apparent gulf between context and statistics? The answer is that statistics inform, but do not replace the context which they operate under. Thus, econometrics can be considered a part of economics. So econometrics is just statistics applied to economic uh, theories. So thus, econometrics can be considered a part of economics, just as economics can be considered a part of ethics. Thus, there are aspects of the management and administration of the household and government which are capable of being analyzed statistically, as I was saying before, and aspects of it which are not. In terms of the former, the statistics would have to be contextualized in a broader, you know, ethical framework. And in terms of the latter, analysis must be confined to non-statistical evaluation because statistics, you can't use statistics to measure something that isn't quantifiable. So therefore, this is our fourth and final takeaway from Aristotle's economics. Economics, properly speaking, is a subsection of ethics, uh, while e econometrics in turn is a subsection of economics only applicable to quantifiable material. So in conclusion then, there are four takeaways from Aristotle's economics. First, that if your context is wrong, then so will, so will your statistics, sorry. Uh, first, that if your context is wrong, then so will be your statistics. Garbage in, garbage out. Secondly, it is not the self-interest of the individual abstracted from all his relationships which ought to underlie economic study of, hum of human behavior, but rather the interests of the family considered both in relationship to each other and to the household. Um, yeah. Thirdly, economics is a part of ethics which deals with the management of the household and administration of government. Finally, just as economics is a part of e ethics, so is econometrics a part of economics that corresponds to the aspect of economics that is quantifiable. All right, I kind of rushed through that, but um, yeah, we have about, we have about uh, five more minutes, so I'm just gonna just gonna go over those four things again in case 
you're so confused in case you miss it because those are the four things that we have that, that are going to be going off of going sorry those are the four things that we have that we're going to be going for that we're going to be using to construct this uh a cath this catholic economic theory um so first garbage in garbage out statistics can't answer can't can't make up for bad context or no context secondly um it's not individualism uh that rules but rather uh it is not the individual but rather the family that is the most basic unit of society um thirdly economics is a part of ethics and finally statistics or econometrics are a part are a part of econ economics um the part of economics that is not that is quantifiable um yeah, so I think that's about it. Um, I uh, actually am surprised that I got done this this early, but yeah, uh, let me know what you guys think. Thank you for making it this far in the podcast, and whether you're watching from economics only or uh, the full length one. And um, yeah, God bless. Think about these things, um, and God bless, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you guys very much once again.